Dave Wanstead joins us now. Hey, Coach, how you doing tonight? I'm great, David. As always, it's always good to be uh, good to be on, and particularly with you. So let's. Uh, what do you want to talk about? I'm a little confused, Dave. I'm used to talking to you on Tuesday mornings on the Mullion Haw Show, but I'm staying up late <laughs> to talk to you tonight. It feels like late. Let's talk right now about Tom Brady. You are the guy. Let's let's be honest here. You taught Tom Brady his first lesson, and after his second career start <laughs> against the Miami Dolphins, 30 to 10, they you guys beat them. Tom Brady learned his lesson. First of all, what do you remember about that game in 2001? Because as you, as we all saw after that, Tom Brady in the second start wasn't so good, but then he became the greatest quarterback ever. I guess, David, the, the lesson there is uh, be careful for what you wish for. You know, Drew Bledsoe was a starter, and obviously Drew was a heck of a player in the NFL, and when he got hurt, and it was announced that Tom Brady was going to start, and he hadn't been a starter before. We obviously thought he was just going to be another guy, another young player, late round, middle round draft pick, fifth round, sixth round draft pick that uh, had to fill in until Bledsoe got back. Well, little did we know, and uh, <laughs> the rest is history. The rest is history. Seven Super Bowls later, he's known as the greatest ever. Dave, I was telling Molly this morning, Doug Coletti, the guy at WBBM stats expert, came up with this one. 333 times Tom Brady started a, a game in the NFL. And 332 time, 333 times his team was in playoff contention. Never, co never started a game where his team was mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. When you talk about success and consistency and maintaining a level and a standard, nothing says it better than that. No, well, if you talk to people uh, inside any organization, you know, whether it was that Tom was associated with New England or Tampa, either one, uh, you know, it, it's the stuff that happens away from the football field that everybody talks about that Tom does, that Tom has, that truly separates him. And by that, I mean uh, the sense of urgency every day to go out there and uh, and get better and, and, and be prepared, not just showing up and practicing. But when he walks in the building, you know, the, the stories go, and I talk to people in Tampa, I mean, if, if you're the weight coach, you're on you're on edge. You start lifting, getting those guys' weights. If you're the equipment guy, you're getting the equipment out quicker. I mean, it, it's assistant coaches, head coaches, everybody within the organization. Tom, a lot like Michael Jordan, he has that ability and has done it by leading the way and moving everyone's play to a higher level. This is the underrated part of his legacy that I really enjoy and appreciate. He was a sixth round draft pick, 199th overall. So you look at how many teams, how many scouts, how many executives were wrong about him, the measurables as they say. Now, that's one aspect to it, Dave. But the other one is every quarterback that followed after he had a degree of success, every under overachieving quarterback, every guy that was maybe didn't have the strongest arm, who maybe was had the instincts and the intelligence, he gave them hope. He was the guy that gave every every player that was you know a, 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 a blue chip player above the shoulders the, the the idea that he could succeed. He was Brock Purdy before Brock Purdy was Brock Purdy. Yeah, how many times did you hear? Tom Brady's name being mentioned uh, in the same sentence as Brock Purdy last week, leading into the, the playoff game with the 49ers and the Eagles. So, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, he's proven a lot, not just to himself, but I think he's been a real encouragement to other players. It doesn't matter really what the position, and, and Tom was a quarterback, but, you know, if, if you got the right intangibles uh, and, and you want it, bad enough that you can get an opportunity and when your opportunity comes you got to take a badge of last thing on Brady okay Dave you know that feels like we've talked about this before you're a coach every August every July you get that feeling you want to be back you want to be at camp you want to be in the mix you want to be with your guys how is Tom Brady going to resist that this time around last year his retirement lasted 40 days how long will it last this year is it binding 
Uh, I think it's binding. I truly do. I, I think that uh, his personal life, you know, I, the, I, people tell me he's lost 15 to 20 pounds. I mean, you can see it in his face. Uh, there's a difference between p- be showing competitiveness on the sidelines and being frustrated and being irritated on the sidelines. A big difference though, from a coach's perspective. And this year, it was frustration and it was irritation. Uh, so I hadn't seen that side of Tom before. So I, I think that he's smart enough then he's got some great opportunities, whether it be with Fox or business, that he said, you know, it is time, enough, enough. I don't want to go learn a new playbook and have to, you know, build relationship with new players. I've been there. I've done that. It's time to move on. I think he's broken his last iPad. I agree. I I agree. All right, Dave, <laughs> let's, let's look at the Bears. Down in Alabama, Luke Getze is getting a chance to be the head coach uh, of the American team, I believe. And you had that experience in 1996. I think it's great for an offensive coordinator to get the experience of being a head coach, especially somebody as young and successful as Luke Getze is. What's the overall value of this experience for Getze personally and for the Bears professionally because he gets a firsthand look at some guys who represent the rank and file of the NFL? You know what? As we were talking, a text just came in from Luke because I texted him earlier. I just happened to be sitting there and I put on uh, ESPN and they were interviewing him and I thought he did a great job. He's asking, they were asking the same questions you were David. And, and Luke was talking about how good the staff was. You know, he was talking about having a, a, a relationship to walk around and get the big picture of what was going on. Uh, and then he just talked about the, uh, you know, the X and O part of it, the different practice organization things that they were going through in today's practice and all week long. So, you know, I I thought he handled it well, and you could tell the way he was talking that that it was a a big learning experience. And I think that'll that'll help not just him, but I think it'll help, you know, Matt Eberflus and the rest of the Bears because now you've got a guy that's, even though it's just one week taste, he's had a little taste of of what it's like to sit in that chair and, and have to deal with other coaches and deal with players and deal with practice plans and guys getting hurt all the things that go into being a head coach that you really don't jump in with both feet when you're an assistant. Anytime you want to shoot him a text to appear on Football Night in Chicago or the Mullen Haw Show, hey, we'll be very uh, grateful, Dave, if you want to do that maybe after the show. Uh, but let's look at the obvious reason that he's down there. He gives him a chance to evaluate talent up close and personal. Dave, when you did it back in 96, I think you ended up having a, an impression made by Walt Harris, Bobby Ingram, guys who Bears fans of a certain age remember very well. The Bears got four players there last year because they were able to maybe see what they had to offer. How important is that aspect? Because now you've got a voice in Luke Getzey's that can be stronger in the draft room, in the war room when they're picking players. Yeah, and there's a big difference between, you know, everybody's down there watching these kids practice. Everybody's can watch the film, the game film from their college days. But when you're hands-on coaching it, as we were, uh, you're in those meetings. You're you're truly seeing how this kid's responding uh, when the tape's on. You know, is he taking accountability? Does he understand what you're talking about? Is he coachable? Uh you know, in the dining hall. Now you're in there, and the only coaches that can eat in there are the player coaches that are that are coaching the game. So now you're sitting in there with these players from all over the country, and you know, I took it as a way of just observing. And you're having conversations with guys away from football. So there's so much uh, that you can grasp from that that this gives you that strengthens your gut feeling, or one way or another, saying, you know what. This is a guy that we want on our football team uh, because he's going to help us win and he's going to be the right player to fit in. You're the best, Dave. Thanks for your time tonight, Coach. Okay, David. Talk to you later. We'll get Luke on there. All right. I'll hold you to that. Good morning.